But if you talk to people who, you know, have actual knowledge of it, there are parts of that story that I do not understand at all that are really, really, really dark. It's so dark that I, you know, haven't told my wife about it. There's a spiritual component there that I, I don't fully understand. Welcome to part three of the special presentation with Father Dr. Joseph Iannuzzi entitled The Vatican and Extraterrestrial Life. So Father, will you start us off with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Father, in this part three of this special presentation, we asked you to go over a systematic exotheology expounding upon the creation of angels, extraterrestrials, humans, and other forms of life. So let us, in this field of speculative theology, attempt to unravel the mysterious meaning of why they're here, why they exist, why God created them. Are they in some way related to the operation of good and evil by grace or by sin? What is their place in the interaction with this earth and with mankind? Because in part one, we talked about how the government, science, eyewitnesses, and military reports acknowledge that there is interaction. This is a field open to free discussion. So it's not a matter of doctrine. It's a matter of probability based on sound, reliable sources. So I will refer to scripture, teachings of church fathers, church doctors, try to put their, all these pieces of the puzzle together. God's creation of Lucifer and the angels. Okay. And then we'll move from that to the rebellion of the angels, to the creation of man, the sin of man, original sin of man and woman, to its impairment on the human nature of all of us through conception, to the incarnation of Christ, his work of redemption, resurrection, setting forth of the Holy Spirit, to finally the outpouring of the gift of the restoration of this primordial holiness that both Lucifer and Adam enjoyed before sin, making a full circle of this talk. Okay, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. Oh boy, this is gonna be a long, <laughs> this is gonna be a long part three, but go yeah. ahead. Yes, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and he separated the two, the immaterial from the material, the metaphysical from the physical, the tangible or the empirical from the non-tangible, the non-empirical, the uh, a posteriori from the, post, from the a priori and the list goes on. The point is God made this distinction between that which we can taste, see, smell, touch, hear from that which we can't, at least on a physical level, sensorial level. Why? So that we could pass a test by faith, not with seeing, not with hearing, not with smelling, not with tasting, not with touching. So this journey is really posited upon one big test of faith in that which is homogenous to our human nature, which is the truth. God made us in truth because God is the truth and he made us in his image and likeness. And that truth is always within us. It's called by Thomas Aquinas, the natural law. This natural law is our conscience that enables us to discern without any formal education, right from wrong in general terms. With education, we know more specifically how to apply this natural law. And Christ summarized it with the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So angels had to pass a test to enjoy the beatific vision, which they did not enjoy before that test. Yes, they were created as spiritual, immaterial beings in heaven, but they were not confirmed in that state because they had to prove their loyalty through a test. What was that test? It was, according to St. John the Evangelist, transmitted to St. Polycarp, Church Father, transmitted to St. Irenaeus, church doctor and father, that Lucifer was given knowledge by God, infused knowledge, 
that the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Logos Permaticor. Well, this word Logos really was at the time of the Greeks an impersonal force in nature, like the, let the force be with you. But it had no personal quality to it. John applied that word to Jesus Christ, making it a personal God. The test was that Lucifer, by virtue of the knowledge he had from God, conceived obedience to God's plan by acknowledging that the Logos would incarnate himself within a, not an angelic, but a human nature, thereby raising human nature above in nobility, angelic and all other natures. Lucifer, in response, said, I will not serve this plan. As a result, God availed himself of an inferior ranked angel, an archangel, not a seraph, which Satan was, mm -hmm. not yet Satan, Lucifer, and that is Michael. And Michael defeated Lucifer, who then, when he fell, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky, became Satan, the devil, the ancient serpent, the dragon. Mm -hmm. All synonyms for Lucifer, who turned evil. And Lucifer stirred mutiny against God. By asking, demanding, he had authority over the whole material order, Lucifer, before he was bad, that they join him in mutiny. One third, the book of Revelation reports, of the stars, not just the angels, the stars, fell with him. So Lucifer failed this test. So he was never admitted to the beatific vision. What about Adam? Lucifer was created probably millions of years ago. The Bible does not report this. We know from several approved prophetic literature uh, recounts that it was a long time before the creation of Adam and even the creation of the universe. Remember, the universe is material. The angels are immaterial. So after five long epochs of creation, God in the sixth epoch creates man and woman from the clay of the earth, Adam's created outside of the garden, but in Eden and placed within the garden of Eden. Eve is created within the garden of Eden, taken from the side of Adam. They have to pass a test to prove their loyalty to God to inherit heaven and the paradisiacal state of Eden. How do they do this? By obeying God's imperative and found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. You shall not partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but you may partake of any of the trees and any of the other fruits of the trees, but that one you shall not. Why? Jesus tells the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, why? God wanted to test Adam's will. It could have been anything, but God chose something as simple as a fruit. And not even Adam and Eve could do that. So Lucifer tempts Eve, Eve tempts Adam, they both fall. How did Lucifer get into the Garden of Eden? Jesus again said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. The book of Genesis states that Lucifer was condemned. And the Bible reports that he was cast down to earth. To earth, Lucifer. Where did he land on earth? I don't know, maybe Geneva. <laughs> the point is, Lucifer came here, and St. Peter adds that. Some of them went to Tartaru, some of these fallen angels that make up this one-third. In his letter, in his second letter, chapter 2, verse 4, Peter states, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but condemned them to the chains of Tartarus and handed them over to be kept for judgment. Where is Tartarus? Tartarus was a Greek place in the Greek classical literature for the underworld, the netherworld. It was never clearly defined, but a place of doom and gloom and despair and possibly torture. And it was under the earth. So Lucifer became known as this evil person who was admitted to Eden because before he fell, God gave him mastery over the entire material order, the physical, empirical, a posteriori, material order. Lucifer was king, and this is proven in Scripture. When Satan tempts Jesus in the desert, remember what he said? Took him to a pinnacle, 
and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, not just of the time in which Christ lived, of all generations, he showed Jesus. And he said, all these are mine. Maybe that's the only time in scripture Lucifer told the truth because Jesus called him the prince of this world. So Lucifer had claim over this material order. How? When he was good, God gave this gift to him like a pearl, like a mother does to a child on Christmas day, bringing the child to the Christmas tree, opening up the presents. Mm -hmm. Remember, God never takes away his gifts. Lucifer still has this access to earth. Then comes Adam and Eve, who fall because of Lucifer's doing and because of their covert will. They could have said no, but they didn't. And St. Thomas Aquinas also articulates that Adam could have reprimanded Eve, could have corrected her. If Adam did not sin, but only Eve, original sin would not have affected us because sin came in the world through man. And that's why Jesus Christ became a man because since sin came into the world through man, it has to be expelled through a man. And therefore they were denied their confirmation in the beatific vision like Lucifer because they failed their test. Then the Blessed Virgin Mary comes and the Blessed Virgin Mary passes the test. She gives her yes at the moment of the Annunciation to the angel Gabriel. And in that moment, the Messiah is conceived in her womb by the seed of the Holy Spirit. Scripture relates that, that there were these beings that fell from above that had relations with the daughters of men. They found them so beautiful that they produced this giant race. Now, genealogies are given a lot of importance in sacred scripture. We find genealogies in Genesis chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 11. We find it in both Gospels of Luke and Matthew. In both of these Gospels, one goes back to Abraham, the other goes back to Adam, but they all end with Jesus Christ. Why does Scripture give so much importance to bloodline genealogies? And why do they end with Christ? This is all related to Lucifer's fall, to these beings that had relations with the daughters of men, and to the direct bloodline of Christ, or that goes all the way back through Abraham, Noah, to Adam. Scripture relates that the Messiah would come from David's bloodline. It is important because God keeps his promises. God established the bloodline from Adam to Noah to Abraham through Jacob, Judah to David. And in the New Testament, as I noted, there are two genealogies. And they both end with Christ. Because once Christ accomplished the incarnation in human nature, he has forever sealed the human nature as the crown and the glory of all creation. I mentioned in part two that even though the angels surpass us in spirituality and intellectuality, God, because of the incarnation, raised us above them in nobility. I mentioned this in detail, quoting from Louisa's writings in part two of this series. St. Paul relates, once Christ became incarnate, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This means that the bloodlines don't matter anymore once Christ achieved that incarnation in that pure, uncontaminated DNA bloodline of the human race. What am I suggesting here? When Lucifer fell, a third of the stars fell with him. So as I mentioned in the New Testament, there are two genealogies, one from Matthew, one from Luke, and they both end with Christ. Why? Because once Christ has achieved that incarnation, he has forever sealed the human nature in nobility and therefore raised it for all eternity above all other rational beings throughout the cosmos from angels to the possibilities of other sentient beings occupying other planetary systems. St. Paul relates this in the letter to the Galatians. That is, he relates that the bloodline does not matter anymore once Christ is incarnate. This presupposes that Lucifer, who had mastery over the material order, was able to still influence the DNA of mankind. How did he do it? How could he do it? 
Remember, Lucifer got into Eden because God gave him the gift of mastery over creation. So Lucifer roams the earth like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. St. Peter says something along the same lines as well in his first letter. So Lucifer is here with the fallen angels, and they are working to try to steal souls for all eternity. And if we go back to the book of Genesis, we see Lucifer's same activity, no different than today, working in chapter 6 with these unusual beings that fell from above known as the Nephilim. The Nephilim had relations with the daughters of men, and they produced what is referred to as a sort of race of giants. Now, giants obviously cannot have physical relations with small individuals. It's physically impossible. But there is evidence, archaeological evidence, to suggest that people as far back as the Old Testament, they had technology to generate electricity, to experience advanced technology. Plato speaks about a place that had a very advanced technology. And who knows? they may have been able to reproduce in some way we're not familiar with. The point is this. We do know from scripture that these beings had relations with the daughters of men, these, this giant race. Satan was given the knowledge that Christ would assume a human nature. He wanted to stop it. And this explains, at least in part, the reason for the importance of these genealogies, that the bloodline had to be kept pure and unblemished. In fact, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it states that Noah was without blemish. What does that mean? The Hebrew word is temim, which is the root word for temimot, which means without a blemish. It means his bloodline was pure. That's what it can mean. And this could explain in part, I say in part, why the genealogy had to be kept unblemished from foreign nations. They could not mingle with any other nations in the Old Testament so that Christ could be born of a pure human bloodline, thereby raising that bloodline and therefore the human nature of that bloodline in nobility above and beyond that of the angels and all other beings. When we look at it from that perspective, from the speculative theological perspective, we see that this bloodline goes from Adam, 10 direct descendants of the bloodline to Noah. From Noah, 10 direct descendants of the bloodline to Abraham, and then on and on and on to Christ. And once Christ is incarnate and he accomplishes that mission, as St. Paul says, there's no more Jew, Greek, slave, freeman, Again, this is not doctrine. This is not dogma. The church allows the speculative theology to explain many mysteries of the Bible. And this is a very probable explanation for these mysterious passages and personages in the Old Testament. So when it comes to Abraham, God tells Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, he promises Abraham that his offspring of his bloodline will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and as numerous as the sands on the shores of the sea. Why would God promise it just to Abraham's bloodline? If not, because he was a direct descendant of that human bloodline of Noah to Adam, 10 direct descendants. So there's this continuity kept by the Aaronic priesthood that could only be received by inheritance. The Old Testament priesthood could only be received if you were in that bloodline. And that priesthood that Christ gives to us today with the sacramentology of the Catholic and even Orthodox faith, we all have seven valid sacraments, is not the end of the priesthood. It's still a voyage toward that perfect priesthood, which is a full circle back into Eden, the Adamic priesthood. Adam had the plan A priesthood that did not require blood sacrifice as did the Aaronic priesthood, as does the Christian priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood offered up animals. The Christian priesthood offers up the blood of Christ, the one lamb who puts an end to all animal sacrifice. But this isn't the end. The Catechism states that when Christ comes back in the flesh, all the sacraments will cease because he contains them all. We don't need them. We're with him. And what does he do? He restores to us the same holiness and priesthood, which is part of that holiness, that our first parents enjoyed before sin. This is called the Adamic priesthood in the paradisiacal state of innocence, 
What was the offering Adam and Eve offered up as priests? Remember, they were not priests in the ordained ministerial Petrian sense of the word, no. They were more priests in the common sense of the word. These are adjectives from the Second Vatican Council. Ministerial priesthood reserved only for priests because of the original sin of Adam, who was a man, and Christ, who undid the sin of man, who was a man, and the common priesthood, which is accessible to all men and women. Adam and Eve enjoyed this common priesthood in the Garden of Eden. What was their gift and sacrifice? The letter to the Hebrews says that all priests are separated from others to offer up gifts and sacrifices. Well, what is the gift and sacrifice of Adam and Eve? It was the human will. They never did their own will. They sacrificed it, held it always up to God. And what was their gift? Uniting their human will with the divine will and returning God, capital, double redoubled glory, redoubled accidental glory for all creation. That was their priesthood. What is the gift and sacrifice of the Old Testament? The animal sacrifice. And then they would give in as a gift, turtle doves, heifers, bullocks, things like that, which would later become a, a sacrifice and atonement for sin. What is the gift and the sacrifice of the new Christian priesthood that Christ instituted as a sacrament? The body and blood of Christ is both the gift and the sacrifice. And we join in that by giving of ourselves as a gift to Christ by allowing him to possess us. We talk about diabolical possession very quickly and accept it very easily. But have we ever thought about divine possession? It's real. God never violates our free will as does Satan. And Satan cannot control our will. He can enter the intellect and memory, but the will is our free choice. We can accept or reject Satan's promptings. God never violates the free will. So he invites us. And once we say yes, then he floods us and invades us and possesses us with our consent to become other Christs. And that's our gift to Christ in this Christian priesthood, whether we are ministerial or common priests. You know, I, I never even thought UFOs were real until fairly recently. Me either. Yeah, at first. They're hiding something real that implicates yeah. them. And yeah. if they're talking to these entities, whatever they are, and I, I believe on the basis of evidence that the U.S. government has made contact and has had continuous or at least sporadic, but over a period of years contact. So to summarize these three parts of this theme of the Christian faith and the possibility of extraterrestrial life throughout the cosmos, in part one, we addressed the scientific and anthropological data as well as the declassified military and eyewitness reports supporting extraterrestrial life on other planets and its interaction with humans and even governments here on Earth. The Naval Officer Admiral Richard Byrd, the Canadian Minister of National Defense Paul Hellier, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso, Sergeant Clifford Stone, a devout Catholic, another devout Catholic, Charles Hall, who was a nuclear physicist and U.S. military worker, also Monsignor Corrado Balducci. This forms part of also the religious aspect of the evidence, ecclesial evidence. He was a spokesperson for the Vatican and a member of the Vatican Curia a long time, and he was also an exorcist demonologist of the Archdiocese of Rome that worked with Father Amworth, my mentor. And he gave many interviews on the reality of extraterrestrial life throughout the cosmos. Also, we share the expert witness of Father Jose Funes. I also shared that of his successor, Brother Guy Consolmano. The incredible experience and report of the lay Catholic theologian, Bruno Samachicha, who put out a book that was endorsed by Pope John Paul II. Uh, he explains his 1956 event that happened in Pescara, Italy, that won for several years this went on. And he had video footage as well as photographs to show it. There's also the reports of others I didn't mention that I don't want to go into now, but very briefly I'll mention one in particular, a very credible source, who worked at Los Alamos National Labs in New Mexico at S4, which is about 15 miles south of Area 51, and was asked to reverse engineer early in aircraft came out in public with this. And he talks about a beautiful experience where he was in a lab and he was looking at this reactor about the size of a football that produced its own gravitational field. And that was that is Robert Lazar. We spoke of the historical and archeological evidence as well. 
of rational civilizations and structures, pictographs, hieroglyphics, civilizations that predate by millennia the creation of Adam. And we know from Pope Pius XII's encyclical, Humani Genitis, in particular Article 37, that Adam is the first parent of all humans who was created in 4000 BC. And these civilizations far predate him, which means they were not human, but they were rational sentient beings nonetheless that were here long before Adam was. And this is also testified to in the mark God put on Cain so that no one would harm him, suggesting that others were there at the time that could harm him. Then we addressed in part one as well, the biblical evidence, Genesis, how God was created Adam and then the Nephilim appear in chapter six in Genesis as well as in Numbers 13. And these race of giants known as also the Anakites and the Emites to support the archeological data. And then there was the hagiographic evidence that I addressed when I spoke of writers in the Catholic faith that talk about life throughout the cosmos physical, rational life, like Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, St. Padre Pio Pietralcina, St. Pope John XXIII, who had a personal visitation, as testified by Cardinal Capovilla in 1961 at Castel Gandolfo. And Pope John Paul II referred to these alien space beings as our brothers. Pope Francis addressed the issue of whether or not we should baptize aliens. It's, there's a lot more weight to this than, than I realize, you know, a lot more uh, cover-up than I realize. Some of the buildings were, were very tall, spherical and domed buildings, spherical and domed buildings uh, that were very large. It's interesting because I tried to relate them in my own mind to, to structures here on Earth, and they, they don't compare to anything that you see here. In part two, we address the ancient Greek classic scholars, as well as the patristic, scholastic, and contemporary theologians who spoke of the possibility of extraterrestrial life. I mentioned how Hippolytus of Rome spoke of Epicurus and Lucretius, who supported the idea of extraterrestrial life. I also spoke of Aristotle, as well as Aquinas. Father John Buridan of the University of Paris, Father Joseph Pohl, Bishop Nicolas Oresme, the 1277 condemnation of the Bishop of Paris, Etienne Tempierre, and William Borillon of the 14th century, the French philosopher and theologian, who was the first author to have raised the question on whether or not the plurality of worlds can be reconciled with the incarnation and redemption of Jesus Christ. And he affirmed that it, they can be, that Christ in one incarnation and in one redemption has redeemed the whole cosmos. And Paul corroborates this when he states that Christ reconciled all things in heaven and on earth. I spoke of also Nicholas of Cusa, the 15th century German Catholic cardinal, who was also a philosopher and theologian. And he also, in his work, De Docta Ignorancia, talks about the possibility of not just other worlds, but many, many other worlds in which rational sentient beings live and thrive and how they were not affected by original sin as we were. Padre Pio made that statement. Vaudelon made that statement. Um, Padre Pio made that statement in similar terms. It suggested, it suggested in the writings also of Nicholas of Cusa. And then I addressed Saint Hannibal di Francia, who spoke of Christ creating many worlds. And then Jesus Christ himself reveals to the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, of whom Saint Hannibal di Francia was the confessor appointed by her bishop, that God could create thousands and thousands of worlds. In part three, we addressed how God created the material and the material orders, the material and the immaterial orders, and how the angels of the immaterial order, led by Lucifer, were put to a test of loyalty. One third failed that test. One third that had fallen in Revelation chapter 12, verse four states stars. A third of the stars fell. And I explained how stars in the biblical concept does not refer only to angels. One third of all those planetary systems and star structures under Lucifer's command fell with him. Remember, as I mentioned in 
parts two and three, Lucifer was given command over the entire material order. And when he fell, a third of all the material order fell with him and its inhabitants. It's, it's a very plausible teaching. And I emphasize that there are parts one, two, and three that we are here dealing with not dogmatic theology, not with doctrine, but with speculative theology, meaning this is a matter open to free discussion. I refer to, in parts two and three, to the biblical meaning of stars, comprising one third of not just the angels, but all rational, sentient beings of the cosmos that fell with Lucifer. And this may explain the millions of reported traumatic events of alien abductions, many of which are also published by Dr. David Jacobs. He studied over a thousand cases of people that have claimed to have been abducted. And this phenomenon of an alien abduction, I've come to understand after having spoken myself with abductees, is not a myth or a theory, it's a reality. And we have to come to accept it. Millions of people will not be lying throughout the world over decades and centuries. This has been going on for a long time. And one person I will share that I had spoken to briefly is a woman from British Columbia, Canada. And she shared with me how her mother, she, her daughter were all abducted. And I did send her in the mail some holy water, holy oil, exercised water, exercised oil, and things like that, because these things do stop these abductions. There's another report of Dr. John Edward Mack. He died recently. He was a Harvard PhD professor who interviewed and clinically studied individuals who were abducted and published two books in 1994, 1999 on the trauma that accompanies these abductions. Now, these are related, in my opinion, to this one third that fell. And then you have, of course, the two thirds that are good, the majority. And these are the ones of whom Clifford Stone speaks and Philip Corso writes about and so forth. After Lucifer fell, Adam fell. He, unlike Lucifer, was a material being and he failed to pass the test of loyalty to God and how God preserved unblemished the human bloodline, so much so that the Aaronic priesthood could only be inherited priests of the Old Testament had to all come from one common and pure human bloodline. Man was made greater in nobility to the angels by virtue of the incarnation of Christ and how Lucifer was given knowledge that Jesus would incarnate himself, not within an angelic, but within a human nature, thereby raising human nature in dignity, not in knowledge, but in dignity above the angels. Uh, there is a connection, therefore, between Satan's rebellion against God's plan of becoming a human and not an angel, and these unusual beings in chapter six of Genesis, the Nephilim, who appear on the scene and have relations with the daughters of men. And I mentioned how these Nephilim produced a giant race. In the same chapter six, a few verses later, it emphasizes how Noah was pure genetically. Now, when the Nephilim are mentioned, immediately thereafter, the very next verse, it says, God saw that there was so much wickedness that he decided to flood the earth. So the Nephilim are connected with wickedness. And then after that, Noah is presented as pure. And that pure bloodline, Christ would assume and forever redeem the human race. Father, could you please end this presentation with your blessing? Through the intercession of Our Lady, Queen of Heaven and Earth, our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe, descend upon you and remain with you always. And may God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.